Dream Team, it's your boy D-Neil back with another reaction video, guys. Here we are with this true crime case changed Australia forever. Before we jump into this case, make sure you guys subscribe, ring notification bell, get a video a thumbs up. Let's find out what changed Australia. One of the first true crime stories I ever covered was Abraham Shakespeare, this guy that won the lottery and was then Are murdered you? for all of his money. Now, before I heard that story, I just Elf kind of had this me. assumption that you could choose to remain anonymous. If I swear to God, I've always thought that you could remain anonymous. You could like, because why wouldn't you be able to, you should be able to remain anonymous. Like, why would you not be able to, like, that, you know how big of a target you painting on yourself going to collect that? They should, lottery people should have known that. You can't. If you won the lottery. Because obviously having a giant sum of money all of a sudden, that's going to put a target on your back. 100%. Right? Well, the truth is that in most U.S. states, you can't remain anonymous. At least not without Still? a bunch of legal loopholes. And just based on what I've seen, I'm not the only one that thinks this is crazy. But I did some more digging. Yes, that is absolutely insane that you can't remain anonymous. Like, they coming for you, dog. And it turns out there are countries where you can remain anonymous, specifically wow. Australia. And it's all because of this one story that I'm about to tell you. Australia's first big kidnapping, a crime that still haunts the entire country to this day. This is the tragic case of Graham Thorne. As I've been researching this case, I've been seeing this one phrase pop up over and over again. It was the end of innocence in Australia. And that's kind of what it was. I mean, it was the first big kidnapping case the country had ever seen, brought about this idea of stranger danger, just completely changed the way that society was over there. And it was also super important from a crime aspect because it was the first case that really used modern day forensics to help solve the crime. So oh, we're gonna wow. talk about both those things later, but first, let's just start with some background. Okay. 1960, New South Wales, Australia. Construction on the Sydney Opera House began about a year ago. And at the wow. time, the government estimated that it was only gonna cost them about $7 million. But unfortunately for them, a year into the construction, they were already running over budget, like way over budget. New estimations showed that it was going to cost them upwards of a hundred million dollars. So That's crazy to think it's going to cost you seven mil to new estimation over a hundred million is an absolutely gigantic jump, dog. The government in New South Wales decided to run a lottery dedicated specifically to raising money to finish the opera house. Tickets for the lottery were $5 each, and the top prize was $100,000. That's, That's smart. That's like $3 million in today's money. And at the time, it was the biggest lottery prize in Australian history. Over the course of the next 30 years or so, 86 million lottery tickets were sold, but only 496 top prize winners were actually picked. Every single wow. person that won had their name, their photo, their location, all printed on the front page of the paper. Wow. And this story is about winner number 10. Here's what happened. That's insane. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are live in Sydney and are eagerly awaiting the results of our June 1st winners. As always, we thank you for supporting the construction of what will be a magnificent architectural and cultural landmark, the Sydney Opera House. We will now draw our first ticket for the grand prize of £100,000. The June 1st, 1960 grand prize winner is Basil Thorne. Congratulations to you and your family, Basil. We will now draw our second place prize. Basil Thorne was a traveling salesman from Bondi. It's a small suburb outside Sydney, pretty close to the coast. He had a wife named Frida and three young kids, Cheryl, Graham, and Belinda. The Thorns were what Australians would call battlers. They were a young couple with young kids all living off of a single income. Jesus. Before they ever three won the lottery. Kids? Time a couple with three kids off one income? Yeah, unless you're a part of the upper 1%, that is not possible today. <laughs> Times were tough for the Thorns. Basil's job as a traveling salesman had become relatively obsolete. And Dang. even though they lived a pretty modest lifestyle, they still struggled to make ends meet. In fact, the year before, 
they had just downsized to a ground floor rental apartment. But all of that changed in a single day. Basil was out of town on business when he found out that he had won the grand prize. And he was so excited that he drove home the very next day, just cut his trip short so that he could celebrate yeah. with his family, collect his winnings, and of course, get his photo taken for the front page of the newspaper. Wow. After they won the lottery, the Thorns didn't really change much about their lifestyle. They kept living modestly. They didn't buy a giant mansion, a brand new car, go on a trip around the world, any of that. They just kind of appreciated the fact that they didn't have to worry about making rent at the end of every month. There you oh, go. Oh, and paying for Graham's school. Just security. That's why I, I, I want to be rich. Not for, and I'm not even got to be rich, but just comfortable. Not because I want like the fanciest things in life. I mean, it'll be cool, but that's never been a true desire. But just the security purpose of knowing that if anything happens, like I'm covered, I'm good. Don't have to worry about it. Know what I'm saying? Don't have to worry about it. But yeah, that that sense of security is is huge, and that that's all I want to be comfortable for. You see, in the years before Graham was born. Basil had saved up enough money to send him off to Scott's College. It was one of the more prestigious all-boys primary schools in the area. Obviously, with that kind of a reputation, there also comes a price. But with their lottery winnings, paying for school wouldn't be a problem anymore. It was actually getting Graham to school every day that ended up becoming a massive problem. At the time this story takes place, Graham is eight years old. So obviously he can't drive himself to school. Yeah. His dad's a traveling salesman, which I mentioned before, and that meant he had the car pretty much every single day out of the week. Sometimes he wasn't even in town. And his mom, Frida, she had to take care of his three-year-old sister. So even if they did have a second car, chances are she wouldn't be able to take him to school anyway. Luckily, the Thorns had a friend in the area named Phyllis Smith. Her sons also went to Scott's College and she didn't mind picking up Graham every single day for school. Okay. He'd come grab him from the corner shop that wasn't too far away from the Thorns' house. And that was pretty much Graham's routine every single day out of the week. He'd get up, he'd get ready for school, and he'd walk over to the corner shop to meet Phyllis around 8.40 a.m. By the way, Graham would walk over there by himself, because you got to remember, it's 1960, it's a different time. People I'm in Australia saying. specifically, they weren't really worried about stranger danger. But on July 7th, 1960, something was different. Graham was running late. It was around 8.30 and he still hadn't left the house yet. His mom was rushing him out of there, all while trying to make sure that he had all of his stuff, his raincoat, his books, his lunch. And as he was leaving, she was telling him, hey, you gotta hurry up and get over there. Phyllis is gonna be there soon. And the last thing I want is for her to have to wait on you. You know, she's doing all this out of the kindness of her own heart. Yeah, So Graham leaves, I feel that. I he feel runs that. over to the corner shop. But at 8.40, when Phyllis gets there, Graham is nowhere to be found. She waits for a little while to see if he eventually shows up, but he just never does. At that point, she decides that she's got to take her own sons to school. You know, she doesn't want them to be late. Yeah. So she gets over to the school and she looks for Graham's teacher. She asks, she says, hey, did Graham make it to school today? Because I was supposed to pick him up and he just never showed. But the teacher hadn't seen Graham either. Wow. And Phyllis was starting to get worried. So she drove back over to the Thorns house. The whole way there, she was thinking, well, maybe, maybe Graham's sick today. Maybe he's just not coming into school and Frida forgot to tell me. She gets over there, she talks to Graham's mom and she tells Phyllis pretty much the exact same thing that I've told you. I rushed him out of the house at 8.30. I thought that was plenty of time for him to get over to the corner shop. And I actually looked up how far away Graham's house is from that corner shop where he got picked up from. It's only about 300 meters, which just to put that in perspective, oh. is about how far I've walked since I started telling you the story. Yeah, that's nothing. 300 meters. Now, Easily Graham's mom minutes. is very worried. She has no idea what happened to her son. So she decides to call the police. They show up, they take her statement, they hear pretty much everything that I just told you. And then the phone rings. Oh my God. Yes, hello? Is that you, Mrs. Thorne? Yes. Is your husband there? What do you want my husband for? I have your son, Miss Thorne. What can I do for you? I've got your boy. I want 25,000 pounds before this afternoon. How do you think I'm going to get that kind of money? You have plenty of time before five o'clock. If I don't get the money by then, I'll feed the boy to the sharks. How will I contact you? I will get in touch with you later on. Oh my God. 
So Graham had been kidnapped, and his abductor had just unknowingly spoken with the police. But before we go any further, I want to clarify a couple different things about this call. Number one, the reason the police officer is pretending to be Basil is because he was out of town on business at the time. He wasn't even there when all of this went down. Wow. Number two, the police officer had no idea the Thorns had won the lottery. So when the kidnapper asked for $25,000 out of nowhere, he thought that was a ridiculous amount. It's why he reacted the way he did. And number yeah. three, Bondi is on the coast of Australia. So when he said he was going to throw him to the sharks, it sounds like a cartoonish threat, but it's actually a very realistic one in this case. The kidnapper did end up calling back just a few minutes later. This is literally effing insane, bro. I just, oh my God. I just can't stand people sometimes. I just hate that people can be so, and don't, I don't mean all people. I know there's absolutely incredible people out here in the world. But the ones that do stuff like this, just, it truly just irritates me to no end because it's like, come on, dude. That's a kid. That is a child that you just kidnapped and threatened to throw to the sharks, and it's sickening. It's truly sick. Later, and this time the police tried to stall for time in order to trace the call. But as he was giving instructions about where to deliver the ransom money, the call got dropped mid-sentence. So not only were they not able to figure out where the call was coming from, but they also still had no idea what to do with the ransom money. The police spent the rest of the day searching the area around the Thorns' house, and also where Graham was supposed to be picked up earlier that morning but they didn't end up finding anything. Wow. Basil and Frida both agreed they would pay the $25,000 ransom. They even offered up the entire sum of the prize money, all $100,000, just to get their son back. But the kidnapper didn't call them back for the rest of the day, so they had no idea what to do with the ransom. That evening, the police held a press conference at the Bondi police station. It was broadcast on every local news channel. The New South Wales police commissioner made a statement about everything that they knew and asked the public to help them bring Graham home. And they closed the whole thing out by letting Basil make a statement of his own. Is there any appeal you'd like to make to him? Well, all I can say is that the person that's got him, if he's a father, he's got children of his own, or for God's sake, see him back in one piece. When I said this was Australia's first big kidnapping case, I wasn't exaggerating. People were horrified when they found out Graham had been kidnapped. And it was because they only imagined this kind of stuff happening in America, Europe, overseas, basically anywhere but their own country. Australia didn't even have laws at the time against kidnapping. They had laws oh, against wow. abduction, but those were kind of written with the assumption that it was always going to be an adult man uh, abducting an adult woman. There was never a kid involved in the crime. When it came to the investigation, police didn't really have any protocol to follow. They had never been trained for something like this. But that ended up being an advantage in a couple of different ways. The first is that they looked at the case through a completely new lens. They looked at it from a different angle, and they ended up using modern day forensics to help solve the crime, which we'll talk about later. Also, the rarity of the case, the fact that it was so novel, meant that the public wanted to be involved. They wanted to help bring Graham home. And they actually ended up playing a vital role in gathering evidence. Ooh. In the weeks following Graham's disappearance, a few different pieces of evidence were actually recovered by the public. And I want to go through them with you one by one. So let's start with the day that Graham disappeared. July 7th. Like I mentioned earlier, there wasn't any physical evidence found by police during their initial search. But after the news of Graham's disappearance went public, people started coming forward with stuff that they thought was suspicious. At around 8.20 a.m., right before Graham would have disappeared, a couple eyewitnesses reported seeing a 1955 Ford Custom Line parked on the same street corner where Graham usually got picked up for school. Police determined there were like four or 5,000 cars that fit this description and were registered with the government. A squad of detectives was assigned to track down as many of these owners as possible. And keep in mind, this was before computerized databases, so they were literally doing all of this by hand. Jesus. Of the owners that they were able to track down and interview, all of them denied being in Bondi the day Graham disappeared. Now, all of that is just based on eyewitness reports, but what about physical evidence? July 8th, at around 6 p.m. the next day, this guy is walking along Wakehurst Parkway. It's near the suburb of Seaforth, like 10 miles away from where Graham disappeared. He passes by this little stone monument on the side of the road, and he noticed there was something peeking out from behind it. As he got closer, he realized it was Graham's backpack. Oh my he immediately God. called the police, and when they arrived, 
they were able to confirm it was the same bag that Graham had when he disappeared. The only oh, thing was, Lord. it was empty. So what happened to all of Graham's stuff? Bro, what happened to Graham, bro? Just please, 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 please tell me that Graham survived, bro. Uh, please, please, please just tell me that this man survived. He had to have survived. He had to have. July had 11th. To have. Hundreds of police, army, and members of the public searched the area where Graham's backpack was found. And less than a mile away, on the other side of the road, they were able to locate all of his other stuff, his raincoat, his school books, and even the lunch from the day that he disappeared. And that was the very last piece of evidence that was found in the initial search. Come Police on. issued a reward of $5,000 for anybody that had information that could lead them to Graham. The Thorns threw in the $25,000 they were planning to use for the ransom, and two local newspapers chipped in an extra 15 oh grand. Oh my God. But no matter how much money they offered up, no one came forward with any credible leads. Even the kidnapper, the one that had asked for the $25,000 ransom, he never got back in contact with the Thorns. At this point, everyone in Australia was asking themselves the same question. Is Graham alive? And on August 16th, they got their answer. Come on. Graham Thorne's body found. That. I just hate, bro. I hate people that could do that to a kid. I hate, I hate anyone that could do that to a kid. That could do that to a person, a human, like. It's, yeah. I really wanted Graham to be alive. I really wanted that man to be okay, bro. This effort sucks. Jesus. That is what the headlines were saying. He was found by a couple of kids about a mile away from where his backpack was found, and his body was covered up with a picnic blanket. And by the way, when I say that kids found him, I mean like eight and seven year olds, kids that were his age, which you've got to imagine was probably pretty traumatizing for them. Needless to say, these kids' parents called the police and they showed up, an autopsy report was done, and it determined that his cause of death was asphyxiation, head trauma, or a combination of the two. Police also knew that he had been dead for a while, probably since the day that he was kidnapped. So the main piece of evidence that they were able to gather at the scene was actually that blanket that he was wrapped in. And this is an actual picture of that blanket. This is where all the forensic investigation starts to happen. Uh, and yeah, please catch that man. And I'm, in the 1960s, if they had a death penalty, uh, if they didn't, God, he needs to, bro, he better not have spent another day free. I'm praying so much that they caught this man. They had to have caught Keep in this mind, man. this is all stuff that hasn't really been done with police work in Australia before. So it's all very impressive what I'm about to tell you. So the picnic blanket. Police were actually able to track down the manufacturer of the blanket. It was a mill in Southern Australia. And they determined that there were only 3,000 of this exact blanket with this exact pattern made. Oh, wow. So that kind of narrowed down the scope of the suspects a little bit. On the blanket, they located two hair samples. There was a human hair sample and a dog hair sample. The dog hair sample appeared to come from a Pekingese kind of dog. And the human hair sample was long, so probably a woman's hair and it had been dyed. Some of them were brown, some of them are red. Mm -hmm. A majority of them had been dyed blonde. And those are both gonna be important later on. Police also located a couple of plant samples on the blanket. And I'm not gonna try and pronounce these scientific names. Basically what you need to know is these are garden shrubs, commonly kept in people's homes. And that's important because neither of these two plants were found growing where Graham's body was discovered. Oh wow. That means it was likely taken from somewhere else, the killer's house, and then placed there later on. On top of that, they took a sample of the soil found on the blanket, and they found some pink colored substance that they thought was mortar, as well as limestone brick. So with these materials in mind, they were thinking maybe this is what the killer's house was built out of. And using all of the information that they had gathered, they narrowed it down to this one house right here. This is an actual picture of the house. It was built with limestone, pink mortar, and it had both of the shrubs that were found on the blanket which by the way, That's there were no crazy. other houses that had both of these plants near them. There was one or the other, but never both except for at this house. So they started talking to neighbors and they said that the family who lived there had a Pekingese dog and the man's wife would dye her hair blonde. 
That's legit insane, bro, that they put it together that quickly, bro, that they... The attention to detail here is beautiful. So both of those match up with the hair samples that were found on the blanket. And finally, probably the most damning piece of evidence, was that the person who lived there had this exact car, a 1955 wow. Ford Custom Line sedan. Got That's him. the car that witnesses say they saw on the day that Graham disappeared. Clearly, all of these pieces of evidence are pointing to the guy who lives in this house. But 100%. believe it or not, this wasn't a closed case. What? Because the man and his family who lived there, they had moved away a couple months ago. But not just on a random day. On the exact same day. Oh my god. Where After months of investigating, go? police finally That's had a crazy. suspect that checked all the boxes. The only problem was he had a chance to escape. So before we get into all that, let's do a recap. We've got an eight-year-old boy that was kidnapped after his parents won the lottery. He was last seen walking to school, but he never actually showed up. Police ended up finding his body wrapped in a picnic blanket, and that blanket ended up being the key to solving the entire case. So that brings us here to our number one suspect, the man that carried out Australia's first big kidnapping. Stephen Bradley. Stephen Bradley. Stephen Bradley was an immigrant from Hungary, and up to this point in his life, he'd been through a lot. Nazi occupation during World War II, post-war communist rule immigrating to Australia, basically Jesus starting Christ. a whole new life. And by 1960, he and his family were being forced to move out of their house and downsize into an apartment. Kind of like the Thorns, actually. It was weird because the Thorns and Stephen Bradley's family actually had a lot in common. Both families wow. had fallen on hard times recently and were struggling a bit financially. Both families had three kids and one of those kids was disabled. In the Thorne family, their oldest child had to live in a special care facility. And oh, Stephen's wow. son was born deaf and went to a special school for deaf children. But Stephen Bradley, he wasn't concerned about what he had in common with the Thorns. All he knew was that Basil was on the front page of his newspaper, waving around a lottery ticket that was now worth $100,000. And he wanted a piece of it. A few days later, Stephen read an article about the recent kidnapping of Eric Peugeot a four-year-old grandson of a very wealthy man in France. That story actually became the basis for his crime, wow. and he immediately started planning. The first thing he did was surveil the Thorns' house. He got their address from a lottery announcement in the paper. That's crazy. They actually lived across from a public park, so... The fact that they put your address in there, too, is insane to me. It wasn't super difficult for Stephen to watch their morning routine without looking too suspicious. After a few days of this, Stephen had a pretty good idea of how mornings went for the Thorne family. First, Basil would leave for work, then Graham would leave for school, and sometimes Frida would go out to the shops with their youngest daughter later in the day. It didn't take long for him to single out Graham as a target, but he still needed some more information before he could go through with the kidnapping. Specifically, he needed the Thorne's phone number to make the ransom call. The only problem was that their phone number wasn't in the phone book. Apparently, they had just gotten a phone like right after they won the lottery, Oh, and it wasn't wow. even connected until a couple weeks before Graham went missing. But you gotta remember, this was a very different time. It was the 1960s. All Stephen had to do to get their phone number was call up the operator help desk and ask for it. It's kind of scary course. to think about how little privacy people had or that, how that little is they cared scary. about their privacy. I mean, that Basil didn't see scary. a problem with having his full name, his address, and his photo printed in the yeah. newspaper. And let me tell you- That's crazy. I mean, you just, but they said they never had a case like that in Australia, so you just, you think everything's good. You think you're safe. And it's like, it is scary. I, I, that's truly scary to have your information just printed out just like that. I'll tell you, according to one source, that's never going to happen today. Certainly not to me. After he got the Thorns phone number from the operator, he wanted to make absolutely certain that that information was correct. He needed it for his plan to go off without a hitch. And the best way for him to do that was to go directly to the source. Wow, are you serious? So he was there. Uh, hi, I'm looking for a Mr. Bognor. Um, there's no one by that name here. The previous tag was called Mr. Bailey. Could that be who you're looking for? Is this the phone number from the slat? 307113? How'd you get that number? Uh, I have my ways and means of getting information. I'm a private investigator, and this is a husband and wife affair. 
Well, that happens to be my telephone number. It's not connected yet. I still don't know Mr. Bog, nor... You could try asking upstairs. They've been here longer than we have, and I might know something. July 7th was... How, so how did... She not mention that to the police? When immediately... It's the day that Stephen picked for the kidnapping. It was the same day that his family was moving out of their house and into their apartment. He'd sent the rest of them on a little vacation so they'd be out of the way of the movers. And none of them had any idea what he was actually planning to do that day. That's Early crazy. that morning, Stephen drove over to the same street corner that Graham got picked up from every single day. He parked it in the same spot that Phyllis would park in. And when Graham came running up to the car, he got out and explained that Phyllis was sick. He was wow. going to be his ride to school for the day. He even acted like he knew Graham's parents by throwing their names out, but of course, he just got that information from the newspaper. Graham believed his story. After all, it seemed like he knew his parents, so he immediately hopped in the backseat of the car. Of course, Stephen wasn't taking him to school. Instead, he drove over to Centennial Park. It was a place that Stephen had taken his kids a bunch of times, usually for a weekend picnic. Those were some of the happiest memories in Stephen's life, but... Every single one of them was about to be tarnished. Stephen parked the car, turned around, and started strangling Graham. He put a chemical-soaked rag up to Graham's mouth until he completely lost consciousness. Then he grabbed a picnic blanket out of the back, wrapped up Graham's body, and threw him in the trunk. Now we all know what happens next. He makes the ransom call to the Thorns, the police get involved, and by that evening, everybody in New South Wales is looking for Graham and his kidnapper. But the question is, why didn't he call the Thorns back? Why didn't he ever try to collect that ransom? He figured well, out according to him, dead. when he went to make another call that afternoon, he checked on Graham, and he found him dead in the trunk of his car. He never actually meant to kill Graham. He was just trying to keep him unconscious long enough to execute the rest of his plan. But it was too late now. If Graham was dead, then there was no way he was going to be able to collect the ransom. And instead, he had a body to hide. Wow. The first place I thought about burying Graham was at their house, the one they were moving out of. That's actually how all that pink limestone mortar got all over the blanket and the body. But eventually he realized that that just wasn't a permanent solution. So he took Graham's body over to a plot of land that he considered buying a long time ago. And that's where police found it six weeks later, still wrapped in Stephen's picnic blanket. Now, I mentioned earlier in the video that Steven had a chance to escape, and obviously it wasn't because police didn't have enough evidence on him. It's because by the time they collected the evidence, he was on his way to London with the rest of his family. He told them that it was just for a vacation, but to me it seems pretty clear that this was like his escape plan. He knew that the police were yeah. getting close and he had to get out of the country. Thankfully, police were able to issue a warrant for his arrest, and when the boat docked in Sri Lanka to take a pit stop, he was immediately arrested, Thank held God, there for an extradition man. hearing, and then sent back to Australia for his trial. Thank Some God. interesting stuff actually came up during the trial, in addition to all the evidence that I already broke down. They also apparently found Polaroid images, like negatives of film, of Stephen's kid using the exact picnic blanket that he used to wrap Graham's body. So it was confirmed that he owned that blanket before. Um, he also tried to make the claim that he didn't intend to kill Stephen and that he probably just suffocated in the back of the car. But again, police used some of that forensic evidence. They tested it using an oxygen mask and found out that there was actually no possible way for Graham to suffocate in the trunk of the car. He was definitely killed by Stephen. So needless to say, Stephen was eventually found guilty of the first degree murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. Good. This case genuinely changed Good. Australia's history forever. For one thing, they created laws specifically about kidnapping, not just abduction. Police started doing more forensics in their work it kind of brought about this idea of stranger danger. And of course, lottery winners were then allowed to remain anonymous. It was given Thank to them God. as an option. Their name, their address, their photo, it didn't have to be printed in the paper if they won. And this is still kind of a hotly debated topic, specifically here in America, where it isn't common that you're allowed to remain anonymous. Personally, I don't I know we why. find some ways to change that because clearly yes. it can be dangerous for people. I mean, it's happened more than once, but I'm gonna let you all, the jury, Decide what you think. A hundred percent you should be able to remain remain anonymous. That is a lot of money coming to you at one time. There are a lot of people 
who are going to want it, who are going to see you as a target. That sickens me that he did that to that child. Like, I don't care what your circumstances are, bro. To turn to, to, to killing a kid, kidnapping a kid is just absolute ridiculousness. Um, I hate that. I hate it so much, bro. That's all we got. Make sure y'all subscribe. Ring notification bell. Get a video. A thumbs up. It's your boy, d -Neil. Out.